Hang on to your assless chaps. We're taking a trip back to a time when men were men, women were mud wrestlers, and the Mac Daddies of Metal were Motley Crew. Just because we wear lipstick don't mean we can't kick your ass. <laughs> And they soaked up the rock star life like lunatics. They ran through houses and wives like other people changed their underwear. From their high-end headbanger couture. They went on a crazy shopping spree and spent $60,000. And their head-turning sports cars. Nothing like an Italian sports car. To party pads so insane, they set the rock star standard for the next 20 years. It was literally a house on a mountaintop. And trust us, the parties themselves raise the bar forever. We're talking strippers, models, porn stars. Plus, from vintage tees to a brand new tour, we've got the goods on Motley's incredible comeback. It's a perfect time for Motley to come back. I mean, where's the competition? We're still Motley. We still rock. This ain't your normal fab life. It's a flippin' flashback. This is Fabulous Life Classics, Motley Crue. a journey back in time to the magical decade known as the 80s. A time when trousers were tight, morals were loose, and every substance on earth got abused, especially hairspray. And nobody lived 80s excess to the max like these four leather-clad LA dudes. Nikki Six, Vince Neil, Mick Mars, and Tommy Lee. Welcome to the world of a True. Take your wildest fantasy of the ultimate rock star life. The booze, the girls, the drugs. You wouldn't even get close to a day in the life of Molly Crew. We f the chicks, we shot the drugs, we wrecked the cars. They spent money like it was water. They ran through uh, houses and wives like other people changed their underwear. They were so badass that from 1982 to 1991, Motley Crue sold a mind-blowing 13 million albums, collected over 40 million bucks in concerts, and at the height of their career, they were taking home an annual salary of more than $10 million. Yeah! So what does a young rock star millionaire spend all that booty on? Anything and everything he wants. Fancy cars, of course, are the luxury toy for rappers today. That's exactly how it was for Motley Crue back then. The car's capable of doing massive miles per hour. Because back in the day, nothing said rock star like a kick-ass sports car. Especially the Crue's car of choice, the absolute must-have automotive status symbol of the 1980s. It wasn't an IROC. It wasn't a Trans Am, it was this. The $90,000 Italian Stallion Ferrari Testarossa. Nothing like an Italian sports car. One guy would get a Ferrari, the next thing you know, another guy would get a Ferrari. It was like an arms race. Vince started it, it was uh, yeah. his fault. Tommy was talking about this Testarossa he wanted to buy, and he saw Nikki a day or two later, who pulled up in the same model, same color, before Tommy could go get it. Testarossa in Italian means redhead, oh, so okay. I, I felt I had to have that. But when it came to car buying bravado, no bandmate could touch Vince Neil. Consider this. At one point, Vince Neil owned a staggering 32 cars, including a Lamborghini Countach, a Ferrari Mondial, and a Rolls-Royce Corniche. The one problem? He only had a three-car garage, so he actually installed hydraulic lifts so he could jam even more of them inside. And each of the garage stalls has got a lift. There's two more sports cars, one on the floor and one on a lift. So there were six sports cars in the garage. But for the crew, it wasn't just about having the fastest ride or the fattest. No, they also needed to be the loudest. Yeah! 
Take bassist Nicky Six. He owned a chopper so loud it was criminal. Nicky's exhaust pipes were by no means legal. They were synonymous with the badass attitude, rock and roller, you know, loud and clear. In 1989, Nicky hit Glendale Harley in California and dropped $16,000 on a Springer Softail like it was pocket change, and then spent another three grand to crank up the decibels. It was roaring up and down Hollywood Boulevard. It was a great time, it was great fun. What less would you expect from a guy like Nicky? They were the first guys to really go out there and spend the bucks on the huge mansions. And of course, if you're a rock star, no ordinary LA mansion will do. Mick Mars, he didn't just buy a kick-ass castle, he bought his own damn mountain. Because his $1.4 million mansion stood high above Malibu on a peak known as Mars Mountain. It was literally a house on a mountaintop you had to climb 2,000 feet to get to Mars Mountain, and then you had to drive all the way to the top of it just to get to his house. Mick moved out there because he wanted privacy and he wanted to get away from it all. Vince Neil, he wanted anything but privacy. So Vince bought a pad where he and his friends could party their long-haired asses off. Vince. There's a lot of trouble. So he dropped 1.5 million bucks on a house in California's Cush San Fernando Valley and added the ultimate party accessory, a mud wrestling pit, so he and his guests could get down and dirty. We're talking strippers, models, porn stars. Vince had a weakness for girls who mud wrestled. I would do anything for one. <laughs> then there's Tommy Lee. He built this $2.5 million custom love nest for then-wife Heather Locklear in a posh gated community of Thousand Oaks, California. At 7,000 square feet, Tommy Lee's lair had everything a rock star needed, except, of course, enough places to park. So to stash his cars, he also bought the lot next door for 900 grand had a huge collection of cars and nowhere to park them. So he bought this choice piece of property next door to park his cars. But the crewmate with the most impressive mansion, bassist Nicky Six. In 1990, Nicky bought his own palace in the LA suburbs. With marble columns, a staggering 12,000 square feet, and a separate chauffeur residence, it was a house fit for a Colombian drug lord. Nicky called it his uh, Scarface mansion. It was pretty excessive for a guy and his wife and baby. They couldn't find each other for days in that house. This house was so over the top that it cost Nicky $40,000 a month just to keep it running. But there was one feature that was worth any amount of money. This. Nicky's 40 by 40 foot custom built pool, complete with a hot tub and his very own in-pool bar. This pool is unique because uh, there's not another one like it. Nowadays, you're looking at about 200,000 to duplicate this particular pool. But it wasn't the extras that made Nicky's pool a wonderland of wetness. It was the unique shape. Because according to Nicky, it was actually modeled after a part of the female anatomy. A very private part. He built an elaborate pool in the shape of a vagina. Haven't heard that one. I had no idea. Now that's a full-on love canal. Coming up, from $1,200 wristbands to $5,000 assless chaps, we'll expose Motley's insanely expensive wardrobe. We catered to the sophisticated rock star. Plus, if you thought they lived large in strip clubs, you'd be right. Motley only tipped in $100 bills. There's a lot of trouble. And later, they're back. Step aboard the Motley Crue Comeback Tour. Nobody really goes to the extra effort to put on a show like Motley Crue. When fabulous live classics, Motley Crue returns. <laughs> Lipstick, mascara, eyeliner, rouge. All tools used to improve the looks of sorority girls, debutantes, and of course everyone's favorite... <laughs> Motley Crew. 
their pretty painted faces caused a fashion revolution. In the 80s, Motley Crue wore more makeup than most women, but they looked really good. They look scary and at the same time sort of attractive. Just because we wear lipstick don't mean we can't kick your ass. <laughs> The crew made millions of dollars and they spent a good chunk of it on clothes. Their stage were alone filled up an entire warehouse. On Motley's 1985 Theater of Pain tour, the band's wardrobe alone cost $100,000. A single outfit could cost up to three grand. They borrowed their look from the Road Warrior movie, Kiss, Alice Cooper, all of those things were in the mix. Oh, yeah. And that was just the stage wear. The crew dropped thousands more on their everyday clothes, all thanks to LA's Chrome Hearts, boutique of choice for rich rock stars with discriminating taste. As soon as they made their millions, they made a beeline for Chrome Hearts. They were head to toe in Chrome Hearts all the time. Too true. Chrome Hearts was Motley Crue's one-stop shop for high-end heavy metal clothing. In a single afternoon, the band once dropped over 60 grand there on items like $1,200 wristbands, belts that cost up to five grand, and $5,000 custom leather pants that didn't even include the ass part. We catered to the sophisticated rock star. But buying a buttload of top-of-the-line threads was just part of their ultra-expensive bad boy look. Because the crew dropped a bloody bundle on tattoos, too. They literally spent tens of thousands of dollars on tattoos. And Molly Crew didn't just have a tattoo, they had hundreds. And trust us, they didn't hit some Tijuana ink shack. They went to the Goga of tattoos, LA's Greg James. I would say Motley Crue sort of invented that style to be the ultimate rocker with tattoos. And having a lot of tattoos, this, you know, heightens it. Back in the day, every hardcore rock star from Ozzy Osbourne to David Lee Roth stopped in to get one of Greg's kick-ass tattoos. But the crew, they were so serious about his ink work. In 1989, while recording in Vancouver, they flew him in to be their own personal tattoo dude. They flew me up. I was just there to tattoo him for five days, whatever they wanted. I was just on call. Turned my hotel room to a tattoo shop. In retrospect, you think about it, but that, that was insane. You'd better believe in the 1980s, no one attracted squealing sex parts like the men of Motley Crue. All the girls wanted to be with the guys of Motley Crue. These guys were so irresistible with women. But there's one story where a girl comes crawling across a third story ledge to climb through Nikki Six's hotel window in the middle of the night. And that was just the groupies. The crew's steady sweethearts were some of the baddest chicks of the 80s. Baby. Nikki Six scored nasty Prince protege vanity. Tommy Lee was married to TV vixen Heather Locklear. And Vince, he got down and dirty with a mud wrestler named Sharice. Vince had such a weakness for all the girls from the strip joints and girls that mud wrestled that he married one, Sharice. But Vince wasn't alone. All of the men of Motley Crue had a weakness for G-string-wearing, lap-dancing ladies. So strip clubs across the country laid out the red carpet to lure them in. Like New York's TNA hotspot, Goldfingers. As soon as they walk in, I would put them in a private section. Then I would make sure they were comfortable and I would start playing girls, girls, girls. And then, of course, they brought out the girls. To ensure the band had the utmost stripping experience, Goldfingers gave them a prime seat and brought out dancer after dancer, up to 35 at a time, just so the band could handpick their own pole-swinging hotties. I would say out of 30 girls, they would probably take half of them, and everybody had a good time. 
especially the girls, because these boys knew how to treat a lady. Motley only tipped in hundred dollar bills, so the girls definitely, definitely loved them for that. It's nice to sit back and watch somebody else entertain you for a change. So, cheers, girls. Ain't that the truth? Coming up. We got scars. We got damage. We got baggage. And an ungodly amount of money. Find out how the crew keeps raking it in. The Dirt is probably the best book ever written about rock. And you won't believe the mind-blowing comeback tour they've got planned. Is they're gonna like be blown away when they see Motley this time. When Fabulous Life Classics Motley Crew continues. The world that Motley Crue knew is no more. New helmet laws have made windswept heavy metal hair fall flat. Lap dancing is now a criminal offense within LA city limits. And the drink of choice for today's bad boy rocker, low carb beer. We've just been flying by the seat of our pants for, for 20 years. The 1990s were all about Bill Clinton and grunge. It was just the wrong climate for a band like The Crew. Public attitudes changed and being a rock star wasn't cool anymore. It was the end of an era. But if you thought you could kill The Crew, you'd be wrong. It's a perfect time for Motley to come back because, uh, I mean, where's the competition? Where are the rock stars of today? That's right, because after being MIA for nearly a decade, the crew is launching the biggest comeback in headbanger history. No matter what's happened in the last 20 years, these guys still are Motley Crew. They're still captivating. Why? Why not? Starting with the 2001 book, The Dirt. The crew's tell-all memoir spent a record 10 months on the New York Times bestseller list, making it one of the biggest selling rock bios ever. The Dirt is probably the best book ever written about rock. It's really spectacular. It's 500 pages filled with the filthiest uh, most despicable human acts ever recorded. We got scars. You know, we got damage, we got baggage. And all that baggage is about to hit the big screen. The crew is in productions with MTV Films to turn The Dirt into a major motion picture. The Motley Crew movie, The Dirt, is gonna surprise a lot of people. The rumored cast so far is Ashton Kutcher as Tommy Lee and Johnny Knoxville as Nikki Six. Tommy apparently prefers Johnny Depp to play him because he actually plays guitar and sings and all that. But books and movies? That's just the beginning of Motley's multimedia onslaught. Because in 2005, the crew's rolling out more merchandise than you can shake a drumstick at. First, the Motley Crew action figures are ready to rock your dollhouse. Complete with fully poseable Tommy Lee and his big bad gong. For the ladies, nothing says sexy quite like these. Your very own Motley Crew unmentionables. Smoke much? Be sure to roll into any party with these. The Motley Crew's signature line of rolling papers. And for the high-end headbanger, an all-new designer take on the classic Motley Crew concert t-shirt, courtesy of chic t-shirt designer, Trunk Limited. We chose Motley Crew for a number of reasons. Motley Crue speaks to our inner badass, and everybody has one. Trunk Limited sells t-shirts that cost up to $300 for bands that include The Beatles and Kiss, but nobody outsells the crew. We can't keep Motley Crue t-shirts in stock. One of the hot fashion items in Hollywood right now are these vintage Motley Crue high-end reproduction concert tees. Everybody wants those vintage shirts. It's amazing that's become a gold mine. And while t-shirts might be a gold mine, the one thing that's always minted money for the crew, music. And in 05, the band's blowing up the Billboard charts again. Red, White and Crew, the ultimate Motley Crew hits package, debuted at number six and sold 90,000 copies in its first week alone. Motley Crew's music means as much today as it meant 22 years ago. It makes me smile. We must start with this
brace yourself. The boys are also raging back with the loudest, lewdest reunion tour ever, hitting 100 cities on their North American tour. Nobody really goes to the extra effort to put on a show like Molly Crew. And each show is a two and a half hour extravaganza of metal mayhem. The band's hauling out seven tractor trailers of equipment, a 60 person crew, little people, and of course, enough pyro to blow your mind. We're still Motley, we're still rock. The kids are gonna like be blown away when they see Motley this time. And this tour's gonna make them a bundle. The band's projected tour earnings, more than $100 million. Oh yeah, it's good to be back. They're the one band that has survived through the years that today's new rock fans really want to see. You just squint your eyes a little bit and you can't tell the difference between Motley now and Motley in 1983. Motley Crue looks better today, more credible, more interesting than they did even when they were popular.